University. She earned her AB in Comparative Literature at Princeton University, a Bachelor's of Music in Opera Singing from the Eastman School of Music, and a PhD in French Studies from Stanford University. She has held fellowships at Cambridge University, the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, West Point Military Academy, and the Society of the Cincinnati. She is the author of several articles and chapters on neoclassical theater, the history of emotions, and race in French history. And she recently published The Military Enlightenment, War and Culture in the French Empire from Louis XIV to Napoleon, which was a finalist for the Oscar Kenscher Book Prize. She serves on the governing council of this august organization, the Western Society for French History, the board of directors of the Consortium on the Revolutionary Era, and the Presidential Advisory Committee of the American Society for 18th Century Studies, where she has been spearheading diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. The title of her paper today uh, plays on Dutch and French words. Forgive me for my uh, Dutch. <laughs> Cour de garde and Cour de garde Vato and the Dutch origins of military enlightenment. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you all for being here today. So uh, I admit that I had a bit of fun in choosing the title of this paper, Vato and the Dutch Origins of uh, Military Enlightenment, because I knew that referring to Dutch origins of the Enlightenment would conjure up a single scholar's name. <laughs> You want to say it or me? Jonathan Israel. Um, so in the wake of Ernst Cassirer's and Peter Gay's unifying accounts of the Enlightenment, capital T, capital E, Israel built his long uh, historical narrative explaining that the unitary ideals of the Enlightenment can be traced to the Dutch Republic. In particular, Israel views what he calls more democratic and historically productive strain of radical enlightenment, as opposed to the moderate enlightenment, to be rooted in Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza's materialism. Israel contends that Spinoza's con uh, conflation of God with nature, his attack on superstition and fundamentalist readings of the Bible, his denial of free will, leaving the passion simply to exist, unmoralized, set a new intellectual agenda whose effects were evident in the clandestine literature of the early 18th century and, after 1750, in the mature thought of French materialists such as Diderot, Helvetius, and Dolbach. In this account, Spinoza and his materialism gave shape to the Enlightenment project and fueled what Israel points to as its most valuable contribution to human society, the pursuit of political egalitarianism and the formation of democratic republics. So I agree with Israel on his overall argument. Not so much about Spinoza, materialism, and radical enlightenment, though. <laughs> Rather about the importance of cross-cultural transmission in early modern Europe, <laughs> and specifically between the Netherlands and France. Without embracing a totalizing argument like that of Jonathan Israel, other scholars have tracked intellectual movements of the Enlightenment to initial rumblings in the 1680s and the growing reaction uh, to the absolutism of Louis XIV and James II in England. These scholars follow the movement of French Protestants and philosophers like John Locke to the Dutch Republic, the Huguenots fleeing persecution after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, and Locke hiding from agents sent by James II to capture him. In this narrative, the Dutch Republic was indeed a breeding ground for novel ideas concerning religious tolerance, representative government, Newtonian science, and materialism that formed part of the Enlightenment period's philosophical bedrock. So I join these scholars in connecting the French Enlightenment to the Dutch Republic, but have been led there by a different historical figure who is not mentioned in any of these previous accounts, painter Antoine Watteau. During the latter years of the War of Spanish Succession, Watteau produced a number of military sketches and paintings. To show just a couple of sketches. These works were wildly popular in their time, but are highly enigmatic when compared to the dominant traditions of military artwork in the late 17th and early 18th centuries in France. Unlike works of the topographical tradition, grand works that were royally commissioned for propagandistic purposes, Watteau's paintings were very small in size. 
intimate, and, as many art historians have since observed, they seemed politically subversive in their representation of soldiers, officers, and war. I find these works highly significant because I view them as participating in the inauguration and popularization of new thinking with regard to military personnel and the martial enterprise, thinking that I associate with the military enlightenment. So in my paper today, I'll say a few words about the military enlightenment in order to situate my research, which has led me to examine Watteau's work in relation to Flemish and Dutch history and artistic traditions. This line of inquiry of, is, of course, not new in Vato studies. However, it has not been sufficiently explored in its details and ramifications concerning military culture. I am thus embracing and expanding this approach in order to analyze Vato's aesthetics in his military works, but also the political, social, and military histories and arguments that they convey. This more historically attuned approach makes evident a different framework for understanding the origins of military enlightenment in France as growing not out of an immediate domestic critique of Louis XIV's army and related propagandistic artistic traditions, but rather growing out of and in reaction to 17th century Dutch history and artistic culture. The arguments that I will make today are not based on newly discovered documents from Vato's time, for alas, we have not found any. Please, someone find some. <laughs> Rather, I aim to offer a kind of cultural genealogy of Vato's military works, one that underscores the many realms in which military enlightenment unfolded in France, and highlights the significant role played by the transmission and transformation of cultural ideas through different minds and media in the early French Enlightenment. So the background, a little less than a year ago, I published my book, as Leslie just said, The Military Enlightenment, War and Culture uh, in the French Empire from Louis XIV to Napoleon. And this book was a culmination of years of research uh, combining archival military memoirs, published martial treatises, different forms of literature and performing arts, political and cultural essays, and more. I read these sources together in order to illuminate the agents, the thematic contours, and practical results of the military enlightenment. One of these concepts, uh, sorry, one of the central topics of the military enlightenment in the literary imagisi, uh, imaginary as well as in martial policy was the common soldier whose personal identity, patriotism, and respectability as well as his need were care, uh, for care were increasingly acknowledged. These perspectives regarding the soldier stand in stark contrast to those presented by Michel Foucault in uh, Surveiller et Punir. In Foucault's analysis, Soldiers were not viewed as men endowed with personal identity and, pre and free will, but rather as military automata, who could be, I quote, made, uh, made out of a formless clay and inapt body, end quote. Foucault contends that the 18th century was a watershed moment in defining and controlling this inapt or docile body in, through what he called disciplines that targeted and regulated even the most minute movements of the human form. While Foucault's schema is grounded in solid evidence, it has been contested with particular attention to the French army, and I, along with other historians, have shown that less disciplinary or consciously undisciplinary approaches to the soldiery also flourished throughout the 18th century. In fact, as evidence from the literary, visual arts, medical, and military memoir corpuses make clear, a culture of care for the common soldier emerged during this period. The soldier was portrayed as a victim of a corrupt military system or as a, a patriotic domestic figure, a father, a son, a husband, or a neighbor, as opposed to a nameless and vicious perpetrator of violence against civilians. A shift in medical and military thought occurred in association with the physical and moral uh, science of sensibilité. Médecins philosophes, surgeons, apothecaries, and military leaders alike worked to bring humanitarianism and sensibility-born medical and moral practices to the martial sphere. They exhibited a caring stance toward soldiers as sensible bodies at war as opposed to disciplinary and coercive stances toward docile bodies. Taking a medical perspective on France's poor military performance, they were part of what has been touted a military medical revolution that worked to improve health care for soldiers and to alleviate the causes of psychological stresses on them from tactics to homesickness or nostalgie. Many also decried the abusive behaviors and lack of sociability demonstrated by officers toward their soldiers and targeted this behavior as nefarious on personal and collective levels. 
This culture of military enlightenment began to emerge in the wake of the War of Spanish Succession and picked up momentum in the second half of the 18th century, following the War of Austrian Succession and especially the Seven Years' War. Yet Antoine Watteau's military works advanced many of these same themes well before these developments. He problematized the plight of the soldier, pictured the soldier's physical and psychological suffering, and critiqued social class discord in the military sphere. What accounts for this precociousness and for Watteau's approach to these martial subjects? As I've mentioned, experts like Julie Platt, Hal Oppenheimer, and Thomas Kaiser have viewed Watteau's work through a highly political lens as a bold rejection of Louis XIV's warmongering. Indeed, it is easy to consider Watteau's military works in this light. Watteau was exposed to the realities of the warfront when he returned to his hometown of Valenciennes in September 1710. Valenciennes had received thousands of wounded men following the French defeat at the Battle of Malplaquet uh, of September 11, 1709. Losses were so heavy on both sides of this battle that the Allied forces could hardly claim it a victory for themselves. That winter was one of the most horrible in recent memory for people in Valenciennes. Record low temperatures led to famine, and the urgent need for manpower meant conscription and sometimes violently coercive methods of recruitment and retention. Desertion from the armed forces was rampant. Historian André Corvisier estimates that nearly a quarter of all soldiers in the French army deserted during the War of Spanish Succession. These deserters roamed the countryside all along France's eastern borders. Such dire circumstances touched Watteau and those close to him, including friends and patrons such as Antoine de la Roque, pictured here, who lost his leg at Malplaquet while serving in the gendarmerie of the King's Army, uh, the King's Guard, uh, excuse me. He convalesced at the military hospital in Valenciennes and most likely met with Watteau during this period. Platz and Kaiser's account proposes that Watteau showed a pointed and subversive criticism of, Louis XIV uh, of the Louis XIV war machine that produced such devastation. For rather than depicting monarchs and grandees triumphantly marching into battle, as the heroic and topographical paintings of Lebrun and Van der Moylen uh, showed, Watteau sketched simple soldiers doing simple things, such as tying their shoes or watching someone tying their shoes. Um, he sketched them in multiple other poses, walking away, pointing, standing, sitting, reclining, daydreaming, sleeping, or preening in the sun. And I'm, I'm sorry that uh, the contrast is um, not coming out well in the projection. In focusing on war as a, pro as a prosaic rather than heroic experience, and in bringing attention to the physical and inner life of the soldier, Platt and Kaiser contend that Watteau was thumbing his nose at Louis XIV, at French imperialism on the European continent, and at the overblown image of Le Grandeur des Grands in state-sponsored military artworks. Yet this political narrative of the genesis of Vato's perspective on war and the military is not entirely convincing uh, to certain scholars, myself included. So instead of looking at Vato's martial works as a direct reaction to the war of Spanish succession, and these analyses do precisely that, um, Aaron Weil, myself, and others are more keen to look at Vato's painterly training and the visual uh, uh, cultural frameworks that it engaged. To wit, Watteau trained his brush by working as a hack in an atelier at Pont Notre Dame, uh, painting reproductions of Dutch and Flemish genre scenes that were sold to adorn the walls of Parisian homes. These paintings were of a very small scale for domestic use and depicted scenes of everyday life, merry company scenes of people playing cards and drinking in a tavern, a mother doing chores and tending to her children as in a domestic interior, or a small military detachment preparing for a march. This last type of genre painting, the Côte de Guerre, or Cour de Garde, as well as outdoor scenes of everyday military life, as opposed to those grandiose scenes of battle, were the stock in trade of Dutch and Flemish artists of the 17th century and came in vogue among collectors in Paris during the early 18th century. These works and the political, military, and social history behind them represented an essential part of Watteau's vocabulary as an artist. 
This cultural tie was established in Vato's childhood in Valenciennes as well, a city that had been part of the Spanish Netherlands or Low Countries until 1678, when the Treaty of Nijmegen formally ceded it and half of the region of Hainaut to France following a protracted and destructive siege. So while I find that Platt's and Kaiser's narratives are plausible and in some ways compelling, I think it's critical to take another path that attributes greater importance to Vato's training and culture of his upbringing, which was in many ways far more Dutch than French. At this point, my query into the Dutch origins of the military enlightenment in France much reach, reach further back uh, than the Dutch golden age, the proliferation of genre painting, and the era of Spinoza. We must investigate the cultural and aesthetic roots of Dutch, of Dutch martial genre scenes that were so influential in Watteau's military corpus. A longer prehistory on representations of the soldier in European, uh, in European artworks of the Renaissance could be traced here, as J.R. Hale has done, and as uh, Valerie Mainz and I uh, discussed a little bit in a conversation in Washington, D.C. earlier this week. However, in the interest of time, I would like to point to two key corresponding phenomena, the Dutch Revolt of 1568 to 1648 and the military reforms of the 1590s pursued by Maurice of Nassau. The Dutch Revolt, or 80s Years Wars, was a successful war of independence by seven northern provinces of the Netherlands who threw off Spanish rule, which had been imposing heavy taxation, increasing centralization of power, and religious intolerance toward Protestantism. The war was composed of a series of rebellions that led to the formation of the Dutch Republic, whose first leader was William of Orange, also known as William the Silent. The Dutch Revolt constituted one of the first major secessions in Europe and established one of the first modern European republics, the United Provinces. The Dutch Republic not only won independence from Spain, but entered into a, a golden age of economic, scientific, and cultural growth and emerged as a mercantilist world power, as we know. As a part of this effort, Maurice of Nassau, Stadtholder, army commander, and son of William the Silent, formed a professional standing army, a state standing army, and pursued a number of reforms to tactics, drill, and the military system, as did Louis XIV at this time, or not at this time, there, thereafter, uh, efforts that historians link to the military revolution. Economic prosperity in the Netherlands fueled an expansive bourgeois uh, market of art collectors. And the recent political and military transformations I've just described had a profound impact on how Dutch people and artists viewed war and the army. First, there was a powerful sense of moral uprightness in the cause of Dutch independence from Spain, a burgeoning national sentiment and the fight to free themselves from political tyranny and religious persecution generated a notion of a just war that Dutch people could be proud to stand behind and participate in. While mercenaries still made up the majority of the new standing Dutch army, the officer corps and civic guard units were composed of members of the expanding Dutch bourgeoisie as well as aristocrats. What is more, Maurice's system of keeping companies in active service on a year-round basis rather than discharging them during the off-season or at the end of a campaign drastically reduced conflict between soldiers and civilians, especially compared to the Spanish army that had brutally sacked towns across the provinces. This improved the army's images in the eyes of Dutch city dwellers as well as the peasantry. The result of all this is abundantly evident in the depictions of war and military men by Dutch artists of the 17th century. While the mercenary soldier with his inordinate violence, fiscal greed, and vulgar mores had long been a motif of Dutch, Italian, and Germanic art, paintings of the 17th century featured a rehabilitated image of the soldier and guardsman as an upright citizen. Individual portraits, such as Henrik Golzius's The Standard Bearer of 1587, and Thomas de Keyser's 1676 painting of standard bearer Leuf Vedrix, and collective civic guard portraits like Rembrandt's Night Watch, dark. functioned at once as anti-imperial, anti-colonial propaganda in support of the War of Independence against Spain, and as a mechanism that portrayed military service as both patriotic and fashionable for respectable Dutch families of the bourgeoisie. These perspectives influenced not only the art of portraiture, 
but also the treatment of military subjects in Dutch genre painting, and especially the Kote Gade, or guardroom scene, which was created by Amsterdam painters in the circle of Pieter Kode, including Willem Doister, Simon Kick, Pieter Kvast, and Pieter Potter. It was also picked up by, by painters such as Jacob Duck uh, from Utrecht, Anthony Palmades from Delft, and Jan Olis in Dordrecht. The work of David Teniers the Younger and of Philips Valveman were particularly influential for Watteau. Like all genre paintings, the guardroom scenes and landscapes depicted figures and incidents that cannot be linked to actual historical events or based on any textual sources. Instead, they exhibit common notions, particularly concerning social order, that were highly legible through the display of identifiable character types, props, motifs, or stereotypes. As such, these scenes were less political than the military portraits, though they maintained traces of the same cultural elements. Soldiers were no longer villains and are not pictured perpetrating acts of violence. Instead, they are portrayed as normal people pursuing their quotidian activities adjacent to the battlefield. Soldiers are shown preparing for a march at leisure while sheltering in a barn or deserted church or interacting with camp followers, not so much prostitutes, but rather wives, children, and domesticated animals. Differences in social class are typically visible since bourgeois art collectors were interested in distinguishing their higher place in the social and military hierarchy compared to the peasantry. And we can see that in uh, this work by Duck with the aristocrats on one side in respectable poses arming themselves. Here we have a drunk uh, soldier, the empty uh, gourd of alcohol is on the side, someone's tickling him with a feather, and then this soldier is probably pickpocketing this other one. <laughs> So, uh, so some of these images are mocking in this fashion, other ones show more social harmony within uh, the Dutch army, or guards. Much more can be said about the Corte Guardia and its evolution in Dutch and Flemish art of the 17th century, so she'll, you'll just have to read my article <laughs> when it comes out. However, in these last couple of minutes, I want to further articulate the connection between uh, Dutch military genre painting and Watteau, whose uses, who uses many of these conventions, but also innovates in ways that were significant for the burgeoning military enlightenment. The style and content of Watteau's martial works are direct inheritors of Dutch and Flemish military genre painting. The scenes uh, are adjacent to the battlefield, the refusal to depict soldierly violence, and the legibility of social class differences are all present. However, Watteau does not permit any whiff of patriotic heroism in his works, and he brings dynamism and tension to these social differences. It is in these subtle manipulations of the Dutch tradition, rather in op than in opposition to Louis XIVian military art, that Watteau advances his critiques of the French military system and the social prejudice, prejudices it brought to the fore. He does this through the depiction of soldiers not merely as inoffensive and unthreatening, but as victims of direct and structural violence whose suffering the viewer must acknowledge. The painting, The Halt, is a trenchant example of this. And this is the only one I'm going to um, examine. Uh, we were just looking at The Halt. Um, elements of genre painting characterize the construction of the foreground. Let me go back to the big one. Uh, the foreground, middle, and background. Directional gazes. Um, between the figures suggest socializing, but there is an undeniable feeling of disconnect or division. Watteau places a billowing tree in the center of the painting, dividing it into two distinct halves. To the right side are the common soldiers, and here's why I wanted to show that close up. Dressed in gray uniform, they are injured, weary, silently tending to one another, or dreaming. Two men look toward a woman who is seated uh, in front and center. She is probably a, so a soldier's wife. She and her child whose little face you can see here, and her husband would have been dependent on the meager rations and low, often unpaid wages of the soldier. To the left of the tree is another scene altogether. Officers uh, donning colored uniforms socialize with one another alongside what appear to be noble women dressed in far greater finery than their counterparts to the right. They do not have children with them, indicating that they had the means to hire a wet nurse or a, govern or a governess. The officer in the red coat extends his arm to command something of his valet, this figure here, 
who is kneeling on the ground. It is not the soldiers who are engaged in drinking and vulgar merriment, but it's the officers. They're conversing, smoking, and Watteau has strategically placed the buvette tent on this side of the painting. And you can see this little uh, re uh, wreath of greenery, which always indicated the buvette tent where you could buy alcohol. Watteau created a, a series of contrasting mirroring effects in the composition, the gleaming white face of the aristocratic woman, whose visage may have been powdered and certainly had not been touched by the sun, is mirrored by the white head covering of the commoner woman that you see in the middle, highlighting her modesty. The two men extending their arms at the extremes of the foreground do so for very different reasons. One commands here, while the other seems to reach out to check on a comrade who could be sleeping or hunched forward in pain. And there are a couple of other uh, mirroring effects uh, that I would uh, mention, but that I won't because of time. So um, <laughs> read it in the article. Um, so through this comparison, Watteau forces us uh, to complicate, uh, to contemplate the way that social injustice is played out in the military. And amongst this division and mirroring, he infuses a sense of tension and perhaps even potential. One soldier in gray leans toward the more aristocratic, powerful, and privileged side of the composition. One might read this subtle placement as a what if. This one right here, who's so close to this woman. What if the officers and noblewomen turned their heads and looked at him? What if nobles extended compassion or sociability toward common soldiers? What if the officer's arm reached out in care rather than in self-entitled command? So to conclude, and turning back to the question of the Dutch origins of the military enlightenment in France, I want to suggest that we continue to examine phenomena associated with enlightenment across disciplines, artistic genres, and national borders. There are still many stories yet to be told in this regard, and Watteau's filtering of Dutch history and artistic traditions is one such story that I find to be particularly significant. As we know, the unjust victimization of soldiers by the French military system, the soldiers' honor and health, and the potential power of social bonds in the army would become central motifs of the military enlightenment. And while reform-minded thinkers in the 18th, in 18th century France were certainly unable to eradicate problems which still plague contemporary armed forces today, they joined Watteau in revealing the traumas of war and of social drama that played out within the military experience. With exquisite brushstrokes and lines of red of chalk, Watteau forced his viewers, patrons, and future generations to think about these issues, to challenge their assumptions, and ultimately to imbue war with as much humanity as possible. Thanks.